to our service this morning. Um, I just have a uh, quick scripture I, I found. I love searching the scriptures for common words. and uh, I came across uh, Mosiah 9.36. It says, Yea, all were gathered together that believed on his word to hear him. And that's exactly what we're here for. And uh, well, there. Um, we'll start off by seeing hymn number 430, or 43. Come thy, come thou fount of every blessing. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time that we are able to gather together and praise Thee and fill Thy love and Thy Spirit. And we ask Thee to bless those that were not able to make it, that they will be able to fill our love and, and also Thy Spirit and have those blessings poured upon them as Thy see fit. And again, we ask Thee to watch over us and that we'll be able to Hear thy word, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, now we'll have a time for off Tori. Appreciate Dan being able to do that for us, and I'll say a quick prayer, and we'll go from there. Our daring Father, we come to thee before our offertory, that we be able to bless it, that we to be used in a manner pleasing unto thee, and that those that receive the funds will be able to use it wisely, 
And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we uh, start the communion hymn, I'd like to thank Lori Publicki. Uh, last minute, <laughs> I was planning on having a cappella, and so I picked very simple hymns that I figured all of us knew, but luckily she came and was able to, to play the hymn, so I wanted to thank her for doing that last minute. But um, So we'll move on with the service, and we will uh, be singing hymn number 276, Here at Thy Table, Lord, and then we'll prepare ourselves for communion.
in as much as possible shall we kneel facing the altar. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Shall we again kneel for the bread on the blessing on the bread, wine? O oh God, the eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son Jesus Christ to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
All right. Well, it is uh, my privilege and honor to uh, introduce our sermon today um, with Pastor Lyle, and uh, we will uh, now hear from him. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to uh, be with you today. Feel of the spirit that was here and um, being able to take communion together. Uh, I'm really a fill-in. Kent Pedersen was, uh, I asked him if he would give the sermon and he told me he would. And then he called me or sent me a text the other day and he said, uh, I'm going to have to back out. He said, but it's up to you. Um, my son Josh has, been, has asked me to uh, um, ordain him to be the pastor at uh, Saints Haven out in Sibley. And he said, I'd like to do it, but it's up to you. So what do you think I did? <laughs> I said, go with your family because that's a great privilege. Um, it was a great privilege for them a couple of weeks ago to have their uh, oldest grandson ordained to an office of deacon and the whole family was there, I understand. And why not be with your family when you have a wonderful experience like that? So it's um, a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to sit on the stand here and watch priesthood um, do the things that they were assigned to do for Dan to collect the, the offering. We don't get to see that very often, but thanks, Dan, for your service. And I see all the other things that are going on. This was the first time that Grant presided, and I know he was nervous, and I told him, just do what the Lord tells you to do. And I said, a lot of times people won't notice, and if they do, oh well, they'll get over it. But he's doing a good job, and, I, and I'm uh, thankful for that. Um, I prayed about it, and I pondered about it, and it came to me that uh, I needed to talk about ministration. Now, I know that Steve Rideout did this a couple of weeks ago, and, um, but it's just a follow-up of that. Um, so many times we... Um, are called to administer to people and as priesthood sometimes we get in a rote position and we say different things that we're supposed to because somebody else said it or it worked last time and you say it again but honest and truly it's a, it's an honor that Jesus Christ gave us that authority to lay our hands upon people's head anointed with oil and administer to them and being able to um, do the will of the Lord and what the Lord wants to do. I, have an, I had an experience here in this um, building. I had a man that um, was suffering from cancer and it was terminal. And um, he came up to me and he said, would you help administer to me? And I said, well, of course I would. And um, so Chris Pedersen and I uh, was asked, and Chris said, well, I'll anoint and you give the blessing. And that put a big power on me. It was like, what do I do? What do I say? And a quick prayer, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord with me, and we laid our hands upon his head, and I pronounced through the Spirit and through the power of God and with the authority that I had, and said, you're going to be healed. That took me by shock. But I told him, that the cancer would be gone. Do 
You don't know what that did. For me, that was the first administration that I'd done since joining the church and having the priesthood given to me. And um, that man is a testimony to me every single Sunday that I see him. He lost his leg, but the cancer was gone. Wasn't what I expected, wasn't what I desired, but it was what the Lord wanted to do. And I've talked to him a couple of times about that, and he's, and he's thankful, and he's active, and he's doing what he feels like he should do. But again, that's a testimony to me because I felt the Spirit of the Lord tell me what to do. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, I knew nothing. I just delivered the message and God took over. So many times there's blessings that come through administration and I'm not gonna um, belabor everything that Steve um, did his sermon on, but I'm just gonna give different lights and, and um, uh, ideas and um, some other feelings that the Spirit wants me to talk about. In, in 1864, Elder Charles Deary was serving as a mission in the region around Bellingham, England. One e evening, he preached a sermon on administration for the healing of the sick. In attendance that night was a young girl named Isabel McKenzie. Isabel wasn't familiar with the restored gospel, but she was interested in hearing what the elder had to say. The words of the sermon resonated with her. She had a, she had a five-year-old sister, Mary Ann, who had been sick most of her life. When the service ended, um, Isabel rushed home to share what she had heard with her mother. After telling her mother the, about the sermon, Isabel expressed a desire to take Marianne to the elders for an administration. Initially, her mother was against the idea because Marianne was sick and very weak. Isabel continued to plead with her mother and shared more about what she remembered from the sermon. Her mother finally uh, consented, and Isabel wrapped Mary and in a blanket and carried her ailing sister back to the hall where the missionaries had spoken. When they arrived, Isabel requested administration for her young sister. Charles Derry and another elder performed the administration, anointing Marianne's head with oil, placing their hands upon her head, and offering prayers on her behalf. Following the administration, Marianne got down from Isabella's, in Isabel's lap and walked all the way home. She was healed. As a result of this experience, Isabel, her brother William, her sister Maria, and her mother were all baptized by Elder Derry. I know this experience is not unique to the McKenzie family and their descendants. The lives, the lives and family history of many saints have been forever changed by the power administration from the healing of the sick. The scriptures, church history, and countless experiences by saints throughout the ages of, are testify of that. Yet administration remains one of the least understood ordinances of Christ's church restored. 
this administration, brothers and sisters, is done through the power of God. Jesus Christ gave that authority to us. Much of the confusion and sometimes even frustration of our surrounding administration comes from our own misplaced focus. Many times we seem um, to focus our attention entirely on the immediate results of the administration, forgetting that God has a larger vision for our lives. If the results we desired were, were, or were obtained during the administration, we, we tend to think um, it was successful and rejoice in God's blessings. On the other hand, if the desired results were somehow not achieved, both the individual who is sick and even the priesthood can be left wondering what went wrong. I know as Melchizedek priesthood holders, there's been times that we have had administrations that we've, been given, we've given and the results that we asked for or we felt like we asked for was denied and the things didn't happen. During administration um, of my wife in the hospital, it was told that she would be healed. I, feel she, I felt she was healed. I felt that administration was a success. It was done exactly what God wanted done. She was healed. She was taken home to her Father in heaven and to Jesus Christ. She was healed. That gave me complete comfort knowing that she was out of the pain and the suffering that she had suffered for a numerous, numerous years. She taught school <clears throat> uh, first graders, and for years she had to walk with a walker because she had back problems. And then it just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, and then her kidneys failed, and um, it finally took her life. She never complained much. I would always ask her, how you doing? She said, I'm doing. Not say anything I could do, no, it's okay, I'll get through it. She never, I never heard her complain at all. There were times that she would get discouraged and, and I'd give her a hug and hold her in my arms or we'd lay in bed and I'd just wrap my arms around her and give her the comfort. And, and let her cry. And then she'd thank me, and she'd move on. So I know that through the administration, that it's sometimes not the results that we want, but we've got to remember that it's the results that Jesus Christ wants. During this time, we can find ourselves in an even deeper hole of despair, wonder, uh, having added emotional pain and spiritual heartache as to render already difficult situation. We've been in there. <clears throat> While most saints know the power of this ordinance cannot be properly understood by, in single terms defined by their individual desires, it is entirely understandable that people dealing with physical, emotional pain and discomfort tend to see things through the lens of their own experience. This is especially true when the desired healing wasn't delivered. Additionally, no matter the outcome of the administration, we tend to spend little time trying to discern the greater spiritual lessons to be learned through the ordinance of the laying on of hands and for the healing of the sick, perhaps it is time to take a fresh look. If we are to gain any meaningful understanding regarding the ordinance of administration, we must begin with the ministry of Jesus. In his writings, the prophet Isaiah recorded the description of Christ's kingdom. 
Say to them that are of fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the dead shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame leap, man leap at a harp, and the tongue of the dumb sing, and in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams of the des- in the streams of the deserts. This is found in Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6. Jesus seems to quote directly from the writings of Isaiah when asserting his own uh, messiahship. In the New Testament book of, of Matthew, we find this account. John the Baptist had been imprisoned and was just a short time from being beheaded. Remember, it was John who was specifically called to bear testimony of Jesus. And it was John who first proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God. John had watched closely the ministry of Jesus. Like the apostles, he probably had his own expectations about how the earthly ministry of Christ would unfold. When those expectations weren't met and John ended up in prison, doubts about Jesus began to enter his mind. John sent two of his disciples to Jesus with the question, Art thou he of whom it is written in the prophets that he, will, he should come and do we look for or or do we look for another <clears throat> there are many ways jesus could have responded with john's question he could have quoted from his own sermon on the mount where he expounded on the meaning of the commandments of god he could have reminded john of the miracle of the loaves and fishes of many other miracles he had performed but jesus chose to remind john john's followers in the things they had seen him do in matthew chapter 11 verses 4 through 5 jesus answered and said unto them go and tell john again of those things which ye do hear and see how the blind receive the sight and the lame walk and the leopards are cleaned and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. By quoting Isaiah, Jesus forever linked his own actions to the prophetic description of the kingdom of God. It's as if he was saying, Here is my messianic evidence, and you yourselves have heard and seen the things I have done. Go tell John. Mormon, who abridged the plates of the Book of Mormon, shared a similar testimony of Jesus. He likewise seems to refer to Isaiah 35 when, the, when, the, when describing the ministry of the, of the Savior to the Nephites. And it came to pass that after he had ascended into heaven the second time, that he shewed himself again unto them again, into them again and had gone into the father after having healed all the sick and all the lame and opened the eyes of the blind and unstopped the ears of the deaf and even had done all manner of cures among them and raised a man from the dead and had shown forth his power unto them and uh, and had ascended unto the father that's in third nephi chapter 12 verse 8 And then we read in the scriptures and marvel at the life and ministry of Jesus. It is sometimes easy to lose sight of the important healing the sick was to him. The earthly earthly life and the purposefully ministry of Jesus can be fairly described by by Latter-day Revelations in Doctrine and Covenants section 22 verses 3 uh, and 5b. There is no end to my works, neither to my words, for this is my work and my glory, 
to bring the past the immortality and eternal life of man. The messianic purpose of Jesus was fulfilled by his perfect life, willing self-sacrifice at Calvary, and his resurrection from the dead. But his, but his actions, Jesus made the way clear for all men to return into the presence of God. Jesus was brought to pass the immortality and e eternal life of man. While engaged in the most important work the world has ever known, Jesus still took time to see the pain and the suffering of the lives of the people around him. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus demonstrated amazing compassion for the people he met along the way. In fact, the New Testament uses the word compassion while referring to Jesus' in interaction with suffering people on many occasions. One good example comes from the 20th chapter of Matthew, which is Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, 34. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Now, compassion, according to the um, 18, uh, 28 dictionary, is a painful uh, sympathy compounded by love and sorrow. So he had love, but he had sorrow for what they were going through. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus was complete, completely God and yet fully human in a, in a way that I can neither understand or, or, or explain. Yet healing the sick seemed to be such an important part of both his, his godly and human sides. On the one, one hand, his healing acts were a fulfillment of his prophetic mission, messiahship, on the other hand, his healing acts were also born out of his human compassion for the people around him. In DNC um, 83, God shared with Jesus, Joseph Smith additional light regarding the ordinance, ordination of Christ's church. In this passage, the role and responsibility of the priesthood, of the Melchizedek priesthood, is fully further illuminated. And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and beholdeth the keys of the ministry of the kingdom, even the keys of the kingdom of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinance thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest until man in the flesh, for without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. According to modern revelation, the power of godliness is manifest to the children of men through the ordinances. This suggests each of the ordinances has something special and unique to desire about the nature of God and our relationship with him. After his resurrection, Jesus visited the Nephites and his words and actions were recorded in the later chapter of uh, Third Nephi. During the short time Jesus spent with the, with the Nephites, he went to great length to share with them the ordinances of his church. Jesus called the priesthood and commissioned them to baptize the, the flock. He shared with them the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He blessed their little ones. He administered to the sick among them and healed them. Jesus had a great desire for the Nephites and also the saints of the latter days to know the importance of the ordinances because they reveal extraordinary things about God. It is through them the power of godliness is made manifest through the children of men. So what special understanding is revealed to us by means of the ordinances of the administration? Like many aspects of our relationship with God, answering this question is very much a work in progress. The, rea the, the reality of life is at times harder than most of us ever expected. Difficult things like sickness, emotional distress, 
come over our lives that we never saw coming and perhaps don't feel we desire. These challenges may be physical, spiritual, or emotional. Maybe, maybe even all three at once. How many times have we experienced that when we've gone into administration and we do find that there, it's emotional, spiritual, and it's physical at times. So we have to heal all three. While we try our best to overcome them, sometimes our, our struggles are more than we can handle. Often we find ourselves in, in a place where we have exhausted our earthly solutions and our storehouse of hope is empty. That is when we can give God our full and undivided attention. With our eyes on him, the power of godliness can be truly manifest in our lives. With God, the storehouse of hope is always full and always available. Administration is a wonderfully personal experience with God. He has created countless millions of people throughout history, yet his desire and vision for each one is very intimate. God knew of our individual struggles from the beginning and has made a special way for hope and healing to be brought into our lives. It is his perfect understanding of our lives and his desire to intervene that is revealed in the power of administration. It is important to recognize the fullness of Jesus' ministry in, by, is encompassed by a combination of both spiritual healing, which is a forgiveness of sin, and physical healing. In three of the four Gospels, we read about a paralyzed man who had four faithful friends. When the four friends brought the man to where Jesus was teaching, they found that the building was full and there was no way to get their friend in to see Jesus. Instead of giving up and going home, they climbed up on the top of the building and they prepared to remove the roof. And they lowered the man down on a mattress, um, but with ropes, and, um, and put him down into the room where the Lord was sitting. And they came unto him in, in Mark uh, 2, chap chapter 2, verse 3 through 4, it says, And they came into the house, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four persons. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they, they let down the, the bed whereupon the sick palsy lay. Can you imagine the commotion that was stirred up when right in the middle of Jesus' sermon, the people broke or looked up to see four guys ripping a hole in the roof and then lowering their friend into the room where Jesus was. What amazing faith they had. Then Jesus gave a command that riled up the scribes in the room. I like this. <laughs> Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes had a fit. They had a fall apart. They were furious that they did not believe that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins. They believed that Jesus could heal that seen it but that he did not have the authority to forgive. In Mark 2, verse 6, he said, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning with their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? But Jesus said something that day that, gave, that for, forever tied together his willingness to heal and to forgive. Again in Mark verse um, 2, verse 7 through 9, And immediately when, Joseph, when Jesus received in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye things in your hearts? Is it not easier to say to the sick and the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven, than to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye... 
<clears throat> but that ye may know that the Son of God hath power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, Arise, and take up your bed, and go the way into the house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and many glorified God, saying, We never saw the power of God after this manner. In this passage, Jesus bound together forever his willingness and ability to heal and forgive unto all overwhelming desire. It is, it is much his will to heal you as it is for him to forgive you. Notice the response of the people who witnessed this miracle, miraculous event. They were amazed and in awe of the power of God before this manner. The power of godliness was truly manifest in them. I can only imagine what the man who was both forgiven and healed thought about the experience. Joseph, Jesus posed a question to the doubting scribes in the room. Is it easier to forgive sins or heal the sick? The answer is they are both easy for him because they are both included in Jesus' desire and will for his people, which, are, which is seen in our redemption purchased in the atonement. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you at times when you need administration, call the elders. They'll, they'll be willing to drop and do what they can to help you. And, and hopefully they'll be able to pray about it and get the will of the Lord when they do the administration. And if it's so right and it comes about, then it's to be. But if it's not, it's not God's desire. So many times I hear that, that when we give the administration and it's good advice, that when you give the administration, you say, or I've heard it said, but by thy will, not ours. So we do turn it to, to the Lord. He's given us the power to do it and to administer to the people, but it really hinges back on his desire and his will because he knows better because he's God. I hope this has helped you today. It, it really did me. I'm sorry that it was such a spur of the moment. I had to read a lot out of it. I tried to memorize it, but other things kept coming up this week and, and everything else. It's been a great pleasure to be here. I hope you felt the spirit I did today. The spirit was very strong, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the willingness that you all have to come and worship the Savior and partake of the sacrament, and I hope you have a blessed day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for those words. Um, we will uh, close by singing hymn number 376, God Will Take Care of You, and we will have the closing prayer by um, Brother Woody Howell. Thank you.
trust you for all. For thou art our God, our Father, our love, thy Son, our Lord and Redeemer, our King, our friend. And, O Father, as we have come and gathered today as a family, your family, may we depart keeping one another in our hearts and our prayers. May we encourage those we meet in the roadway and you present before us for their needs, that, O Lord, we may introduce you to thy living Christ who walks with us and abides with us all the days of our life. Thank you, O Lord, for your unending love. Thank you for one another, O Lord, and may we continue in the blessing of this day knowing that you live and we live in you. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.